Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Valeska Paris. Valeska, welcome to the show. Thank you. Valeska, I'm so glad to interview you. Uh, you joined the Sea Org at six years old. Yes, the Cadet Org, which is a mini Sea Org for kids. That's very young. I mean, what was your comprehension when you're six years old? Do you even know what you're doing? Honestly, um, I was six, Melissa was four, and Raphael was two, and we were just completely confused. Like, I was not a Scientologist. My grandma was a, a Christian, and I believed in God at that time, so it was not what I wanted. But you felt forced to do it. I had no choice. My parents got divorced. My dad got custody. The church was behind him because we were going to be future sealed members. Oh, no, that's very interesting. So they're they're looking at a future unit of production. Yes, and in Switzerland, the mother always wins custody of the kids, but somehow he, with the church backing him up, he got full custody of all three of us. Scientology lawyers. I'm going to pause that right there. You're six years old, but I want to fast forward to something that not a lot of people know that happened at all. And, and, and I just want to illustrate the trajectory that your CR career happened to you. It's about, mm -hmm. it's about 1999, okay? Yes. And you're on the Free Winds, which is the, the church's ship. Where yes. They deliver the OT-8. You're there on the ship, and suddenly, is it the French police raid the ship? Yes, it was maiden voyage, and we were in St. Bart's, and COB was on board, and it was early in the morning, and suddenly all these police officers from St. Martin's and St. Bart's come on the ship with these German uh, shepherd sniffer dogs and start raiding the entire ship. Well, I mean, that's got to be nuts. USC Org, I mean, is David Miscavige on the ship? He was sleeping in his room, and they actually went into his room with the sniffer dogs. While he was sleeping? Yes. Talk about a rude awakening. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Now, now, Captain Mike Napier, was he, on sh was he on board? Yes. Yeah, he was on board. Nobody knew it was going to happen. It, we were blindsided by it. So what is, what, what's the, is it mayhem? Is it like, what do we do? Does Captain Mike take charge or what, what, can you describe what happened on the raid? Um, I don't know. All I know is that there was these police everywhere. Um, I spoke French, so I was sent to the Sky Lounge to like spy on what they were saying. And they were looking at every single passport of every um, Sea Org member and every public on the ship. And they had been given a tip that we had drugs on the ship which we didn't, but I, I, don't, I don't know where it came from. Obviously, it was kept hush-hush, and it was a huge flap because COB was on board. Now, how, how long did the raid last? Was it just a few hours? It was, yeah, it was about four or five hours. And that had to be really, really astonishing. Uh, now, when okay, so the police leave. They go down the gangplank, and they leave, right? Yeah, and they had to come by boat, right, because St. Bart's, um, we would anchor. We wouldn't dock on the actual island. So they came by the Free Winds lifeboat. They came on board. And actually, from what I remember, there was a policeman on the ship that would come on the ship who was friends with um, the port captain and the captain. And I think he's the one who basically arranged this whole raid. That is amazing. Well, what's the aftermath of the raid when the police are gone? Is there sec checking? Is there shock? What's the mood after your ship's just been raided? We left St. Bart's and never returned. And I, I was on the service line, so I don't know what happened um, in the back line, but I know that I think Ludwig got in trouble for that big time. L Ludwig Alpers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he was the port captain. The captain never got in trouble. Like, he always got away with murder, but well, Ludwig got in trouble. Valeska, just to get more information, because a lot of people don't know that the Free Winds was raided in 1999 by the French police. Mm -hmm. Now, when you say that the ship got out of there, the minute the police are gone, 
how, I mean, do you guys pull up anchor immediately and get out? Is it like the, yes. get out? We got now. out and we never came back. Get the hell out now. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Saint Bart's became persona non grata to Scientology. Yes, we've never the ship never returned, and I can guarantee it still has not gone there since I left. That's probably because David Miscavige has a giant engram of the police entering his cabin. You know. Yes, and he <laughs> hates. Like, he hates the French, and I don't know if it's because of that, but he does not like French people. Really? Hmm? Yes. Oh, that's a little, that's a little something to put in our David Miscavige file. Going back into your Sierra time, how did you wind up on the free winds? I mean, can you give us some background that leads up to you getting sent to the free winds? Okay, so I joined the Sea Org at Flag in 1992. I ended up in CMO, and um, I was 14 at the time. And I was put um, to serve the in execs. Just because we have a lot of new time listeners who don't know Scientology language, what is the CMO? Because it's important <clears throat> to know. Okay, so that's the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and um, that was started by Hubbard on the Apollo, and it was when he had small children basically running messages for him and bossing people around. But the CMO went on to become like the senior most management yes. body in the church. So the point I want to make to our new time listeners, new time sound technology watchers, is that the CMO, Commoners Messenger Organization, is a very powerful elite unit within uh, the C organization. That's right. And the, one of the main policies is whatever is said to a Commodore's messenger is being said to Hubbard. So, like, if you're rude to a Commodore's messenger, it's considered to be, like, a crime because you're being rude to Hubbard, and it's pretty much composed of children. So you were appointed to the CMO at age 14 at, did you say, International Base? No, at uh, Flag, Clearwater, oh, at, Florida. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so at, at Flag Land Base. Mm-hmm. And, and again, for new, new listeners, Scientology, Sea Org is a paramilitary organization. That's why instead of having a, a church, you have Flag Land Base or Pacific Base. These are all military bases, if you will. So, your what, what is your job? What is your job at Flag Land Base? Okay, so uh, first of all, I stopped going to school, and my schedule is approximately from 8 a.m. to midnight. Um, and my job is to do laundry for these um, international executives of Scientology, to wake them up in the morning, to make their breakfast, to clean their rooms, iron their clothes. Like, I guess you could say a maid. So you're, you're 14 years old, and you have to work from 8 a.m. till midnight. You're not getting an education. No. And you're basically, all the big shots, you're having to be their maid. Yes, and I have no parents because my dad's in England, and my mum blows the Sea Org when I'm 15. So. Well, psychologically, that's devastating. How, how do you survive psychologically and emotionally? Do you have friends? Or, I mean, what do you do? It sounds gl- depressing. Well, by the age of 14, I was used to it. Um, it was very hard when I was six years old, but honestly, when you grow up in the cadet org, you're used to not having your parents. So I had no real emotional attachment to either of them, which is sad to say, but true. It's very sad, very sad. So you basically are in a situation where you have to raise yourself. Yes. And so you're there at, you're there at Flag Land Base. Now... Before the show, uh, we were talking, and you said that you had developed a relationship with with David Miscavige's wife, Shelley Miscavige. Yes, she was very good to me. Um, I drove home with her in the car one night, and she asked about my education, because for her, getting an education was very important. So she wanted to know about my education. She was on the Apollo and told me her biggest regret was that she never had an education. Oh, I could see that. Well, did she did did Shelley act to help you be, get some kind of education? Yes, she ordered me to go to school, which I went to school in the morning for about two months, and she ordered me um, these mathematic tapes. It was like online tapes, and she got me to do those. And every time she came back and saw me, she would test me on what I had learned on the tapes. Well, now that's interesting. That that kind of gets uh, puts a human face on Shelley. What kind of what was your what was your mood about Shelley? She sounded like she was motherly to you. 
she was motherly to me. I loved her. Um, I would write back and forth to her. I wrote back and forth to her for years. Um, when I had my first boyfriend on the ship, she wanted to know everything about him. Hmm. <clears throat> like, yeah, she was very, like, I mean, not very motherly because it's not like there's much interaction, but more so than my own parents. She cared more about me than they did. Well, well Shelley... Uh Miscavige being on the Apollo when she was young, I guess maybe she could identify with what you were going through. Yes, yes. And okay. for her, getting an education was important. To COB, it wasn't. When he uh, found out we were going to go to school, because it was me and Ty Webb, he was like, school is a waste of time. That's what he said. Which I was happy with, because I didn't want to go to school. Like, I was a kid, and so I was like, good. <laughs> Yeah, who wants to go to school eight hours yeah. a day when you're a kid? I, so, but but uh, now, David Miscavige, did you work with him on the ship? Or were you on his lines? Yes, um, he had a guy called Pierre Diva that served him, and I was kind of on the back lines doing all of the cleaning and decorating and bringing up the food and, you know, like helping out and then serving his people. Now, when you're on David Miscavige's lines, is there a lot of tension? Everything has to be perfect? Yes. Uh, honestly, he was I've, – I've served I served pretty much all of the execs, and he was the only one that freaked me out. But why is that? Because he – it didn't take much for him to get angry, and if you messed up on his lines, it could be over for you. Like, you could end up on the RPF or in the engine room or – you know, and I, I heard him scream from the age of 14. I've heard him scream every time I was around him, not at me, but at other people. And, and there was so much force in his screaming that it was really okay. scary. I can imagine, especially if you're, you're a teenager. Now, now, Valeska, this is something that's important that, that I work to do as a documentarian, a historian of the church. There's consistent eyewitness testimony from people who were around David Miscavige that he did scream frequently and he used profanity. Yes, I learned all my swear words from him. And and he generally he generally was intimidating. Yes, very. He was yeah, and he has the he has a presence like yeah, he walks into a room and you know he's there. He definitely has like a presence. Does he does he walk around the ship or the base with an entourage? Always, always. And it got it got more and more as time went on. Like in the early nineties he he was a lot more laid back and it, it seemed to get worse and worse and worse and he got rid of more and more and more people. Now you mentioned that he things got David Miscavige became worse, took a turn for the worse after the death of Lisa McPherson and the ongoing legal problems. Yes, I was at Flag when that happened, and I was at Flag right after he found out about it, and he was livid, and he pushed away the executives. I, that's when I noticed it. Like Mark Yeager disappeared, and all the photos of him in the offices were taken down, and he became more angry at the other executives, and there was a lot more screaming and. It was a very tense time for the church. What was the mood at Flag Land Base when it, w it was discovered that Lisa McPherson died? And then what did they tell you as Sea Org members happened? I think most people didn't know about it. I knew about it because I was in CMO and I was on the service lines. Um, I know that Alan Kardasinski, the CS, he was taken out and was like on grounds and then ended up on the RPF. Um, but Alan was a Class 12K supervisor, wasn't he? Yes, he was a French guy, yeah. Valesco, in, in the Sea Org, when something really bad happens to a, someone being audited or a preclear, the last auditor to have worked with that person is the one who gets in trouble. Okay, yes, that's exactly right, yes. So, the auditor, the CS, they get blamed for it. So when Lisa McPherson died, the, the CS was blamed. That's right. And the, actually there was um, a nurse who actually spoke to me right after it happened, and she was in complete shock. She was shaking, and she was telling me 
about the ride in the car to the hospital, and she was like, she just died in the car. She was just dead. Um, she also got taken out and put on some low post. So Lisa McPherson died in the car. Yeah, that's and what that's what the nurse told me, like on the way to the they, hospital. They passed two hospitals to take Lisa to a, a hospital further away, where a Scientology doctor worked. That's exactly right. Yes. And, and that's one of those stories that the, the, the church spent, uh, according to Marty Rathbun, at least. Uh, upwards of $100 million defending that case. Yes. Switching topics to something I find very interesting. Your mother did something extraordinary that had consequences. And could you tell us about that? This is something I I didn't know about, and I thought I knew most things, but uh, I'm always learning new things. But what did your mother do that was so shocking and extraordinary? So in um, 1995, she became disillusioned on what Scientology was. Um, And she, after my stepdad died, committed suicide, she went to Switzerland and started attacking the church and went on French TV and exposed what OT8 was. That's a big deal. That is Mm -hmm. really... What happened inside the church? Well, what happened to me is that I was in CMO, so I got uh, kicked out of CMO because I was no longer qualified because I was a potential trouble source. Um, And when she came back from Switzerland to um, Clearwater, I was put on 24-hour watch. Um, I had to sleep in someone else's room. She actually went by the hacienda and tried to find me. Like, her car was spotted, and she left me a gift in front of my dorm, and it was considered to be a big security risk. They didn't want me to leave, so I was told by OSA that COB was going to send me either to the Free Winds or to OSA Int. So that's how you wound up on the ship? Yes. Two hours before my plane left, I was told that I was going to the Free Winds for two weeks. A couple things. First of all, I'm very sorry to hear that your stepfather committed suicide. What what drove him to suicide? Um, he had, well, he was a self-made millionaire, and the church took six million dollars of his money. They made him sell his company, took that money. He also lent money to several Scientologists. They never paid him back. He wasn't able to use. Um, the justice system to get his money back because that would be considered a suppressive act in Scientology. And he was basically depressed, had heart problems, had no money, and was found dead with pills all around him in his bed. Now, your stepfather was Albert Jacquier. Yes. And what I want listeners to please read, if you if you type in Diary of Albert Jacquier, J-A-Q-U-I-E-R. You'll find Diary of a Dying Scientologist, OT7, on Xenu.net, and it was posted on Wednesday, September 11, 1996. It was one of the most heartbreaking tragedies I ever read when I first started examining Scientology you know, in, in the 90s. I mean, it, it made me cry. He was only 59 years old, and it's the diary of a man who's dying and not being helped by Scientology, and he's, he's bankrupt. Yeah, yes. And, and I have to tell you, Velasco, when I, when I read this, it was, it, I, I cried. It was like how I, I, my heart went out to him and to your mother and his family. And these are, these are he, for example, your stepfather lists uh, Jody Darling owes him $304,000 that she didn't pay back. $33,000 to other OTs. Uh, German uh, OT, $344,000. So people just took advantage of, of the man. Yes, because, sorry, he had a, a big heart. Yes, he did, and you, it, it shows it so clearly. And were, were you told that your stepfather had taken his own life, or did they withhold that from him? No, no. He came to flag and actually saw me about two days before he died and told me that he was proud of me and that he loved me. And he took his own life, like, 
or I, yeah, I think it was suicide. It looked like suicide, and it was one day before my birthday, 11 December. Oh, I'm so sorry. That that's just so it it, it had to have hit you very very hard. Actually, yeah. I mean, my emotions were shut off because I was a Sea Org member. I didn't want to be PTS. I didn't want. You know, I, I wanted to be a good Sea Org member. I was very brainwashed at the time. So my mum told me, and I was shocked. But, like I, like, I look back at that time, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, I didn't go to his funeral. I didn't even ask if there was a funeral. I just kept on working. And my mum was like, can you please take some time off? You had, I, to, you had to uh, push it all down. I was like, I'm sorry, I can't. The executive flag, so no, I can't. So they wouldn't have given you time off to go to your stepfather's funeral? No, it's completely a heartless operation. It is, and, and Mike Rinder, when he was a, a, a Sea Org member, early on in his career, he and his wife had a, a baby who died. Yes. And, and they were apart. And David Miscavige would not let Mike Rinder go to the funeral for his, his own infant. I didn't know that. That's terrible. It, it, it is terrible, and, and they invalidate CERG members and Scientologists. Is if, if you have reactions, it's called human emotions and reactions. That's H right. H E and R. And this is part of how they crush a, a person's soul. Yes, and I was trained from the age of six to not have emotions, to not, like, crying was a bad thing. Yeah, when in fact, it, it's actually quite healthy and you express that grief. Yeah, so I don't even know, like, if I shed a tear, it would have been locked in a bathroom when no one saw me, like. Yeah, do you feel, you felt numb, but you have to keep going on working. What, what happened, what happened after Valeska, what happened after your stepfather died? You just keep working as if nothing had happened. Well, I, I was shocked. I I went. I remember being shocked and talking to my mum, but I just kept on working. Like, uh, wh when I was in the cadet org, I was very not a good Scientologist and not a good Sea Org member. But what really got me to change and to become an on purpose, the org member, as they call it, is working for the int execs because there was no one that was more, quote unquote, dedicated than those people. I see. So that gives you a sense of you're, you're working with important people. They're on purpose, so you should be on purpose too. That's what brainwashed me. That's what made me yeah. really believe that we were making the world a better place and that Scientology was the only solution. <laughs> Well, who was your favorite exec to be around? Who were your favorites? Who did you like that were? Guillaume Lesev. He had a heart of gold. He was my favorite. Ronnie Miscavige was really nice as well. Um, Ray Midoff was a sweetheart. Yeah. Who were the Who were the the people who were aggressive, mean? <laughs> David Miscavige. <laughs> um, yeah. Mark Yeager was nice when I first met him, and then he had a car accident, actually. Um, I think it may have been with Heber Gents. I'm not sure, but I know he had a car accident. After that, he was like PTS, and he became quite nasty. Norman Starkey was nice when I first met him. Then he got in trouble with COB, and then he turned into an asshole. What kind of trouble did Norman get into? I don't even know. Like, they all got in trouble one after the other, and they all, like, now it's only COB and his little entourage, so. Uh, did, did you work with Heber Jansch? He was, he was very nice. He came to flag a few times, and he would always tell me his war stories, because he, yeah. I think he played, like, an instrument during World War II, and he would always tell me the stories of, well, actually, uh, as, uh, he was in the military. Uh, it was not World War II. Uh, oh, okay. But you know what's interesting, Leska, just as an aside for our, our, our listeners, but you'll be interested in knowing, Heber Jansch grew up in a, a Mormon polygamous family. Yes, I knew that. And that, you know, that really influenced his view of the world. To, 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 you know, his, his, his father actually was sent to prison for polygamy. 
Oh, wow. I didn't for, know that. For a year. Yeah, and, and that, in, that influenced, you know, Heber's view of things, uh, about religion and all kinds of things. Uh, but, but he was an entertainer, and, you know, he would go on uh, to marry uh, Yvonne Gillum, who, who started the Celebrity Center. And, and Heber, for a long time, put a real human face on the church by appearing as spokesman. Yes, he no, he, he was no relatable. Features. Yeah, he seemed like a, a – was he viewed as a, a well-loved figure in the church? Um, like, just from my view in serving him, he had – he was bigger than life, and he was never nasty. So the people that were nasty were, like, the people around COB, like his – communicator and um maybe like like Larice Stuckenbach yes yeah I mean I didn't she wasn't that bad to me but I saw how she treated other people do you think it's one of those things where you have to take on COB's valence if he's if he's a tough son of a bitch you have to be that way yes you won't you won't survive around him if you're not if you're not merciless no, you had that because that's reasonable. Like that's considered to be reasonable, which is a bad thing. Well, why is being reasonable a bad thing in the church? Honestly, I think if you read Hubbard's scriptures, like especially the flag orders and the the policies related to Sea Org members, it's not a very kind outfit. It's a very it's a business and it's ruthless and. It's good to hit hit people, and it's good to punish people if they don't toe the line, and you can't think for yourself. You have to – you're basically a robot, and that's just the mindset. Well, Hubbard had – Hubbard somewhere writes, you have to make the penalties too gruesome. Yes. And to that point, you were locked in the – weren't you locked in the engine room of the ship for 48 hours at one time? There's a flag order that's on the free winds. I don't think it's anywhere else, and it's written by Hubbard, and its punishment is 48 hours in the engine room straight with no sleep. So, yes, I was sent down there, and I had already had weeks of no sleep. Okay, so it's, it's, it's hot in the engine room. It's Annoying really suit. hot, yes. Yeah. We, we wear boiler suits and um, these shoot shoes, like regular shoes, that is specifically for the engine room, and there's no proper ear protection, there's no gloves, nothing. And what do you do? I mean, you clean the engine? Well, you go in claustrophobic, tiny spaces under the deck plates, and you clean oil up, and you... you um, people go up in the engines... Um, I never did that, but yeah, it's it's really tight, hot. Now, did you pass? Did, did you pass out down there? I did pass out. Yes, I I passed out because I had gotten no sleep, and I was already completely traumatized with what was going on in my life, and I just I was out. Now, is this where you passed out? You were under the deck plates. No, when no. I was under the deck plates, that was earlier, and at that point I um, hyperventilated, and I got yelled at for doing that. So this was another time I was sent for 48 hours, and I was cleaning an engine, and I just blacked out. Yeah, because you, you will, I mean, between that, that kind of high heat and lack of sleep. So this is, this is torture. It is torture. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. No, I I refused to go the second time, and I was physically escorted down there. And this process, it sounds like it sounds like a uh, a way of punishment, and it's illegal, certainly illegal, especially you're a minor, let alone an adult. This is something that would be criminal, kidnap, held against will, confined. Yes, and, and I, I was never a minor, just so you know. The, the first oh, okay. time I went to the engine room, I was 18 years old. And then the last time I went to the engine room when I was down there for three months straight was when I was 29 years old. Well, I mean, it's still not right. I'm saying even even for an adult, it's to, to confine somebody on a ship and hold them against their will, that kind of forced labor. Now, now Ka- 
Captain Mike Napier. Yes. He's the captain of the Free Winds and has been, I guess, since its maiden voyage. Yes, since day one. What kind of what kind of man is he to allow this on a ship he commands? He's a tyrant. He if if you're on his good side, he's all right. If you're not, he is merciless and vicious. And, and what kind of ship does he run? Um. I mean, what is the general mood of the free winds? I, uh, help me out here, because I, there's two people in the free winds, two different types of people. There are the Sea Org members who never get to leave, and then there are the public Scientologists who come and go. Yeah. And so for a public Scientologist, they won't really see what goes on on the ship over time. They're just there for two weeks or, you know, a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. So Contrast the experience. What's it like? What does a public do when they go on, and what do they expect from CERG members to be waited on? It's gotten a lot worse for public, like, because now when they go on, um, they're expected to be on course. A lot of the time, they don't do a lot of excursions. Um, but yeah, they get to eat in the Horizon dining room. Um, they do their Scientology studies. They go to the graduations and whatnot. Um, a CERG member works on a schedule from eight to t midnight, um, there was many times on the ship where we did all-nighters, um, got an average of three hours sleep a night. Um, and the captain, if he doesn't like you, like you get pulled up to his office and he has his little people around him and he screams at you at the top of his lungs. So again, the culture of screaming. Yes, and when I first got there when I was 18 and I was like, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be on the ship, let me get off the ship, I got pulled into his office and screamed at. I mean, does it go on for a half hour or until uh, you back, back, about, back down? About 10 minutes. You don't get a word in. Like, <laughs> he won't let you talk. So you just sit and listen to the screaming. So he berates you, screams at you, and then you're dismissed. Yeah, and he, honestly, he doesn't listen to anyone. Like, he... He's, unlike many Sea Org members, he's a professional and he's a trained captain and he has, like, an education and he knows that. So he doesn't have respect for the RTC rep. He doesn't have respect for the COCMO. I don't even think he's got respect for COB, to be honest. You know, you wouldn't have to if you're the captain of a ship and he, he is a professional captain, which is, which is the only captain of a ship in, in Scientology. So I guess COB in a certain way needs him because where else are you going to get a Scientologist and a CERG member who's, who actually has captain's papers? Yes, there are actually, there were when I was there, a few people that actually were trained to be captains. Um, one of them actually died. He just had organ failure. What happened? It's, that was, oh, I forget his name. He was the nicest guy, uh, Paul McKelvin. I was on the RPF at the time, and his body literally just shut down. And he was, at the oldest, 50. Probably, I think he was in his mid-late 40s. You know, there are a lot of stories of, of early, early deaths, cancer, strange yes. suicides, you know, in Scientology. There was a suicide on the ship. Yes, there was. Jorge, Jorge Arroyo. What happened? So he was an engineer, and he wasn't happy. I don't really know if any engineer is happy. It's a horrible job, like the way it's done on the free winds. Um, and he started going crazy, basically. And I was actually auditing him, and I wrote to the RTC rep and the senior CS, which is the person who was looking at the sessions, and I said, I can't do this anymore. He's going crazy. He needs help. And nothing happened. In the typical SEORG way, he was locked in a room, had a camera in front of his door, and security watching him. And he was handled in Hubbard's way of handling people that go crazy, which is you don't talk to them. You yes, can... this, is, this is the introspection rundown. Yes, so you're not allowed to talk to them. So no matter what they say, you can't talk to them. And there's even drugs that are prescribed. Um, Jorge didn't take drugs, but 
he one day was like, I'm going to go have a shower, came out of the room with a sheet and went into the shower and hung himself. Oh, my God. Yeah. And what happens when they find his dead body? The security chief came back because he'd run off to get, like, a coffee, and he knocked on the door and broke the door open and found him dead on the floor. So it was... It wasn't like, oh, you know, it's so sad this guy's died. It was like, oh, my God, this is a flap. This is such bad PR. So the captain came down, the senior CS came down, and um, this woman came down and tried to revive him to no avail. He had, like, his, there was black all around his neck. So uh, we were in... Bonaire, I think, either Bonaire or Aruba, and we sailed to Curacao with his dead body on board because we had better PR in Curacao. Now, th- now this is extraordinary. He, he dies in one port. Mm-hmm. So rather than handle it with the police, the authorities in that port, you, you sail with the dead man on the ship to another port and claim that he died in Curacao. Yes, because Curacao had the best public relations with the free winds. Oh, and the authorities there would sort of just, you know, go along with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is just an incredible, incredibly shocking story, but it's not surprising given Scientology's machinations and how it works. Cover up anything that could be bad PR for the church. Yes, and nobody on the ship found out except for like a handful of people that were in where I worked, which was like the auditors and stuff. Um, I had to get his folder and I had to have a black marker and I had to black out anything that had the RTC rep in it or CMO or any executives. I had to black it out. I had to black out my whole um, letter that I wrote saying there is something wrong with this guy. Really? So you had to make it, your records disappear, you know, alter them. And not only mine, but any, because he had like an obsession with the RTC rep on the ship. So anytime he mentioned her name in any um, counseling session, it had to be blacked out. That, and then where do the records go? Do they, did they go into the hiding? Oh, his folder must still be on the ship. Like Probably in a, probably in a vault or something, a safe. Yes, and nobody was allowed to know. His own brother, who was also an engineer, was kicked out of the Sea Org in case he was like the brother, and he was told that he had a heart attack. Um, They were a Mexican family, and his entire family in Mexico were told that he had a heart attack, which is absolute bullshit. They told his family he had a heart attack, and the authorities in Curacao signed off the death certificate. In Curacao, they were told that he committed suicide, Um, because he had to have an autopsy, and obviously you can tell with an autopsy that the guy didn't have a heart attack. Oh, Um, I see. So he was taken off the ship in a body bag, and the captain and the port captain were all over it. They did an autopsy, and then there was a girl called Evelyn who he had been in love with, and she was made to go into court in Curacao and testify that he did it because he was obsessed with her, which is a lie. Oh, this is just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So, so this this whole thing is is stage managed. Blesk, I want to tell you a story, and our listeners a story because this is not this is not an isolated incident. Okay, now Nancy Cartwright, who was the voice of Bart Simpson on The Simpsons, mm-hmm. she is a Scientologist. Yes, and, and she's been on the ship many times. Yes, I've met her. And she was at one time engaged to a fellow Scientologist named Steve Brackett. Okay. Now, Steve Brackett uh, committed one of the ultimate Scientology sins for an OT, and that was to go broke. Oh. You know, to run out of money. Like my stepdad? Exactly. He started having hard times with his construction firm, right? Now, he went up to the – he went up to the bridge – up at Big Sur, the Bixby Bridge in Big Sur. Yeah. One more, one early morning, and he jumped to his death off the bridge. Oh, wow. Which, 
he killed himself. Well, how symbolic is it that he was going up the bridge to total freedom and he wants to send a message by jumping off a bridge? I mean, yeah. and it's a steep bridge. He kills himself. The Church of Scientology told its members that he died in a head-on car accident. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this is, you know, I wanted to just to emphasize Jorge's suicide on the ship was lied about. He, they told his family he had a heart attack. Scientology doesn't, on, it, it's not honest even with its own members. No, and you know what the RTC rep told me after he committed suicide? What? Because I was crying. I, I, he was my friend, and I actually liked the guy. And she's like, you can never tell anyone what happened. And he was an asshole for doing that. Like, he is an SP. There was no funeral done for him. Nothing. She told me, like, she had wanted him to go off the ship and stay in a hotel, and the captain is the one that insisted he stayed on the ship, and she was pissed off at the captain for that because it would have been fine if he had just killed himself on the island. Oh, you know what? The, exactly, because I have heard stories at FLAG where people have gone type 3 or psychotic, and the first order is get them off the base. Yes. In fact... Aaron Smith Lev and I had interviewed him, and he uh -huh. said that there was a fellow at Flag Land Base who had a stroke, a Scientologist, you know, yeah. cerebral, hem cerebral hemorrhage. They dragged him off the property and put him on a bus bench. Oh, my God. So, so that he wouldn't die on the property. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It, it's like actually with my stepdad, I have a feeling he died at the sand castle and they moved the body because his car was found at the sand castle. Well, now look at this. To protect the church, make sure the dead body is not on church property, then it's someone else's problem. Yes, there is no empathy. There is no care for the individual, and they are looked at as, you know, despicable, disgusting for doing that to Scientology. Like, Jorge was like, how could he have done that to Scientology, and how could he have put us in that position? It's not like... The guy had mental issues and needed professional help and was depressed and and tragically committed suicide. It's like, you know, what a piece of, excuse my French, but what a piece of shit for doing that. Yes, that's, that's a very Scientology approach. The story is told that when Quentin Hubbard committed suicide, when L. Ron Hubbard got the news, he said, look at what that kid has done to me. Look at what that effing kid has done to me. Yeah. And he was thinking in terms of his reputation. Yeah, but, I actually, I heard someone from someone who was around at that time, and apparently Mary Sue was devastated, and he was just angry. That's what I heard. Yeah, that's what I've heard, that she was inconsolable she 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 broke down because her, her son has killed himself and she just broke down and, you know karen my wife karen knew, knew, knew mary sue hubbard very well and she was very good friends with quentin and um she you know mary sue was just inconsolable but ron was furious yeah ron that's hubbard what i heard furious. Yeah, but you know let's contrast a few things here death death in scientology it's just not something you grieve over or mourn about. It's a PR issue. Does this look good for the church or bad for the church? Mm -hmm. That's right, and, yeah. You know, and let's get the body off the property if we can. And how dare they die and do that to us? Yeah, and the fact that he committed suicide was considered even more, like, it was considered evil. Like, he was considered to be an S for doing that they didn't even do a funeral there was another guy that uh, was on a ship who was a security guard and he had stomach pains forever and there's no proper care because there is no proper facilities and then it was found he had stage four cancer and he was sent to LA and I actually went and looked after him for a couple months at the end of his life and they at, least, they at least had a funeral for him, but it was like handle it off the ship with PR and, you know, like let's have him die without causing a flap. That's stunning but not surprising for Scientology. I, I want to get a contrast from you, Valeska. 
When you were on the ship, your birthing, where did you sleep in a bunk? When I first, well, the bunks are like metal beds, um, super crappy. So I was in a little room with metal bunk, metal cabinets. There was like six of us in a room. Isn't there a mattress on the metal? There's a, yeah, there's a mattress, which is like the cheapest mattress you can possibly buy. It's like a piece of foam or something. Piece of foam would be better. <laughs> it's yeah. worse, yeah. I take your point. I mean, when you go camping, you can put down a piece of foam. So you're you're basically sleeping on a slab of metal. Yeah, a little bit better than that, but yeah, not comfortable. Yeah, yeah and, and what are David Miscavige's quarters like on the free winds? Lavish, uh, beautiful. And they're dedicated. They're only for his use only. Yeah, and the ones on the free winds are probably the worst ones because it's probably the smallest one. Um, but yeah, he lives like a king. Like his, he's got the best of everything. His his clothes are all tailor made. He's got his own steward that does everything for him. He's on a special diet. He's got a personal chef. His Emily Jones was his steward, and she would have a book where she would have to keep track of the calories he ate to make sure he didn't go over a certain amount of calories. Oh, yeah, and a special diet. And when when when, when uh, David Miscavige comes aboard the free winds, is there an advanced team set? Does everything everything have to be done? Like COB is coming to the ship, we have to do it, get it white glove clean. Yes, and we spend like in like in um, the early nineties. Actually, the there was a thing called Solus safety of life at sea and it's from what happened on the Titanic and we had to get everything done before maiden voyage so we were literally up um, at first it was go to bed at four in the morning and it was then it was up all night and we were actually they were installing the sprinkle systems and the waitresses were on our hands and knees picking up blue asbestos with our hands and putting it in garbage bags for months Really? So you were exposed to the notorious blue asbestos the free winds had on it? Yes. When they did the sprinkler system, they had to take everything, like the overheads down, and we were the ones behind. And we didn't know about the blue asbestos, but we would have, like, itchy skin and red marks all over our arms. Oh, that's that's just a nightmare situation. Yeah. And, and then uh, when COB comes aboard the ship, is, is he like, is there some big ceremony where the captain welcomes him and he has his cabin with fresh fruit and whatever he wants in it? Well, actually, when he comes, it's like quiet. And I think more like the people around him know. And But yes, he's got his own dining facilities. He's got his own birthing. He has his whole entourage that he brings with him. Then there's people on the ship that are put on his service line like me and Pierre Diva. Just to kind of end, end the show, to just show the contrast in Scientology between the brutality you suffer, the suicide of Jorge, the things that go on that the public doesn't know about. You told me something I found really appalling, and this is all with tax-exempt dollars. Mm-hmm. When, when Tom Cruise came aboard the ship with David Miscavige, they have a they go diving, right? Mm-hmm. It's not just when Tom Cruise comes. Like, the later years, he stopped going diving, COB did. But even when Tom right. Cruise wasn't there, there was a yacht um, in Bonaire or whatever island we were on. There was a yacht that cost $2,000 a day, which as far as I know, the IS pays for. And it was there in case he wanted to go diving. So it's two thousand dollars a day, and it's just there for his convenience in case he wants to go diving. Yes, and there was one year where he was on the ship for like at least two months, and every day he would go diving. Um, he would take professional photos um, while diving, and we had to like go and watch his stupid slideshow of the photos he took. <clears throat> and then so, it, so it, that was at night. No, in a, well, we had to a couple times. We had to go um, down. We were getting no sleep um, on the usual crap Sea Org schedule, and we all had to go and be on time and go downstairs. At, at each, like every Sea Org member had a different time allotted where they had to go, and we had to watch this stupid slideshow of 
photos he has taken while diving and we would be like sitting there trying to not fall asleep so, you know because then we'd get in deep shit for falling asleep so you have to watch his his slideshow of fish <laughs> you have him diving would, would, would he narrate it no 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 he's too cool for that like so, so i so he like can't even be bothered he's he but he wants an audience anyway yeah and then not only that, um, at night there would be, there's a cinema on the ship and every night there would be um, a, mover, a movie flown in, which I don't know how much that would cost because most of them were like new releases and he would go down and eat hot dogs and watch a movie every night and he ordered that the crew watch like three movies the whole time that he was there. Wow, that is really something. Uh, wh- one question, Glasgow, were you there when Tom Cruise had his, his birthday party? Yes, I was there when he came on the ship with Penelope Cruise, and him and C.O.V. were going diving, and they would also go in Bonaire and ride these motorbikes. Um, but I didn't get invited to the birthday party because I was in lower conditions because I had a coal saw in front of C.O.B. Like I was, really? Yeah, I was in there trying to like get the food together and it was his food, and he came in, and he saw that I had a cold sore. So I was um, – actually, Emily Jones and Valerie came out, and they were like, oh, you have a cold sore, and it's contagious, and blah, blah, blah. So I was, locked, like, put in a room, and I had to stay there until my cold sore went away. And I was given oh. um, FPRD sec checking to see what my evil purposes were on – David Miscavige and Shelley Miscavige for serving them with a coal saw. Oh, that just is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. So they make this some cosmic criminal incident because you have a cold sore. So yes. You so, must have evil purposes to destroy them. And I was put on a meter and I was like, I don't know what, like, I couldn't think of anything. So I was given ethics interviews and yelled at, and then I had the COCMO come downstairs and yell at me after my session because I didn't come up with big enough crimes. So, Well, what was the end result of it? The cold sore went away and you went back on duty? The cold sore went, well, actually when I was in a room, I had to work on my bed. Um, but then, yeah, I went back to post. But I was in lower condition, so I wasn't invited to Tom Cruise's party in the, um, the Starlight Cabaret, which was actually a blessing in disguise because I cannot dance to save my life, and everyone had to dance. And if I went up and danced, I would have probably ended up in the engine room with the three other girls that ended up in the engine room. So <laughs> why did they end up in the engine room? Did they get in trouble as a party? They got in trouble because when they were dancing, they were being interesting, whatever that means. And (laughs) (laughs) see, you see why I'm glad I didn't go because I can't, I can't even sometimes. So it's a crime to be interesting in front of Tom Cruise. Yes. (laughs) I don't even know what that means. I know, right? Everyone had to dance, right? Right. So, but you. But you can't be interesting. You can't dance stuff. interesting, which is why I'm so happy I didn't go because I cannot dance to save my life. So everyone would have noticed me. But, yeah, so then afterwards they were all locked in a room, three girls, all from ISA, and they were not allowed out of the room until they wrote up all of their crimes and they one of them had to pee in a garbage can because they wouldn't let her out to go to the toilet. And then they spent months in the engine room getting FPRD sec checked and were in trouble for literally a whole year. Because they had been interesting. Because they were interesting in the way they danced in front of Tom Cruise. My gosh. Well, you know what, Leska, this interview we've had has been fascinating. So you're not in trouble. It wasn't merely interesting. It was fascinating. And I'd I'd like to do another one. I really appreciate you giving us some insights into your time on the ship, but I wanted to get into your story about you know when you were a child at um, the Cadet Orc, mm. yeah, and that hellish that hellish bad place, Stonelands. Yes, I would like to cover that because for me the biggest biggest crime Scientology does, in my opinion, because it's close to my heart, is children 
that are put in the sea organization and they're born into it and they don't have a choice. Scientology children is terrible as well, but I'm talking about the sea org children who lose them their parents and to get put to work and it's not our choice yeah that's I'd like to hear about that and and maybe how you eventually you know left the Sea Org and, and you know, found your way back home and, yeah and I think I think you were very brave to, to you know to be a six-year-old and have to raise yourself and that kind of thing and to, to, to come through it it's a very brave thing to do it especially because you have so few resources. Yes, and so, I have to say, at the end, when I was in the engine room, I contemplated killing myself, and I even found a scrap of metal which I put to my wrist, and the only reason, because for me, my life was worthless at that point, and there, it was too painful to live, the only reason I didn't is because my sister was out and I was like, maybe she'll forgive me and let me back into her life. Mm. Yeah, I could I could see that. There's always a, Well, I'm glad you had that glimmer of hope. Yes, that was my hope and my mum. But my mum had put OTA on the internet and I was still, you know, brainwashed. So for me, she had more cross the line, whereas my sister had done nothing other than talk to my mum. Well, just one final question. Uh, on the scale of horrible things in Scientology, mm -hmm. if you say that Stonelands, which is a horrible haunted house-looking place in England mm -hmm. where children were put, yes. where, do, where does the free winds rate on the scale of horrible locations? The, is it one of the worst? Yeah, you know, the free one's the ship. I mean, are there other are there worse places to serve? Is it Pack Base bad? Is the ship worse than Flag? Or because it sounds the ship sounds just like a hellhole. Well, the Cadet Org was horrible. It was disgusting living conditions. Like we didn't even have toilet paper growing up, and we were starving all the time. Um, and we were children, so that has an impact on me and it always like that what was done to me can never be taken away no, um, so that's the, that's the worst place but I have to say the free winds when I first got there it was horrible I had the same feeling that I had when I was six years old and I went to the cadet org and I was completely lost and empty inside but it has like the food is better and blah 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 um then I got used to being there, and I was a good Sea Org member, so I was like, well, this is my fate. This is what I have to do. Now, at the end of my time on the free winds, when I was in the engine room full time, that was traumatizing for me. Yeah, it's just a nightmare, that, a nightmare existence in the Sea Org. That was as bad as, for me, it was as bad as the Cadet Org. And I, yeah, it was the most horrible, degrading thing Scientology uh, watchers have said for a long time, former members, critics, Scientology is always worse than you think. Yes, and to give you a comparison, I've, I've done everything you could do in Scientology. So I did the RPF, right? When I left the ship, I went to the RPF, and RPF is hell. It's horrible. But I felt freedom going to the RPF compared to what I went through in the engine room. Wow. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up on that point because I would like to contrast the hell of the engine room with the RPF and Stonelands and some other stuff. And these details are so, so valuable for people listening. And I often tell quote unquote religious scholars who, who I have contempt for basically especially those that, that work for Scientology they're mm -hmm. lackeys yes that these religious scholars especially the Scientology horse who take pay in one way or another that they need to listen to Sea Org members who've been through the nightmare read the stories of your, your, your stepfather because real Scientology isn't in the doctrines, they miss the entire point, is in what the church actually does to people, how it, it rapes them, yes. kills their soul, crushes them. And that's the real thing that these phony religious scholars never look at. 
they, they use their PhDs to talk about bitter defractoplastics. And that's such moral degeneracy on their parts. There are such disgusting religious scholars out there. Yeah. Gordon Melton, you know, the fellow down at, down at Claremont, Westerbrook, who has no idea what Scientologists, he interviewed Scientologists for his, his PhD research, which I would have taken his PhD and thrown it in the trash, put, you know, put him back down to a bachelor's program, or, or, or I would have put him in RPF and said, okay, Don, <laughs> West, Westerbrook, let's, let's put you in our RPF for one year and then see what you think about Scientology, you bastard. I think and, that has to do with the individual and, and how they are as a person and whether, whether they have a moral compass or not. Like, same with people like Tom Cruise and Kirstie Alley. And, you know, they're not in the sea org. They're in the real world, and they have the ability to look. And the fact that they're not looking and they're advocating it is not okay anymore. No, it's not, and they're not allowed to look, and they don't care to look. They can look if they want to. They... Exactly. If Tom Cruise wants to go and, you know, just read one story of what somebody went through, then he would know. And he knows, he actually does know, because he knows about what the in execs went through. Yeah, and it's just so so strange that he's not touched in his feeling or his heart. Yeah. Or, or moved by the suffering. And, and we'll, 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 end it, we'll end it there, Valeska. Okay. And just one... One thing I ask some of my guests to do occasionally, there's someone out there listening who's still in the church under the radar and they want to get out badly, public or Sea Org. What do you have to say to them? Um, uh, I have to say I understand exactly what position they're in, especially if they have family members that are in and they don't want to lose their family or their jobs that are connected to Scientology. Um, I have compassion for what they're going through but honestly the only way to stop the evil that this cult is doing and has done is if we all band together and say enough no more and we tell our stories and we take a stand and I hope they're listening to that and they take those words to heart because it, you do have to at some point be self-determined and take action so, Valeska Paris, thank you for being on Surviving Scientology Radio. We look forward to having you on again. All right. Thank you. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.